uh, the first time I remember meeting Calvin was at a New Year's Eve party. It was December 31st, 1980. It was at a friend's house in Bethesda, Maryland, which is just north of the city here. Uh, it was snowing a lot. I remember that we were at this this party, and Calvin was there. I may have seen him before. I don't remember, but he was not really from here, but had been around for some reason. I didn't really know who he was. I did know. I think he had, but I do remember. I believe he had pink bandana tied around his ankle or something, or something. You know, something that was sort of, kind of like, just didn't seem like right, particularly given that era, like what was going on. That no one, no one in their right mind would wear a pink bandana. I just was kind of thinking about this part of the country and had never been here before. And uh, my high school friend, Shannon, had had actually borrowed a t-shirt from her that said the Evergreen State College on it. And people would say like, what is that? I'd be like, I don't know. I finally asked her one day and she was like, she looked really embarrassed. She was like, oh, my uncle went there. It's kind of like, oh, they don't have grades. And I was like, oh, no grades? Awesome. You know, so um, he had actually given her a catalog, and when I looked through it, I thought, oh, this is really great. Well, basically, I was homeless here. Uh, and through a uh, youth job thing, I arranged to get a job at Chaos, becoming the first full-time paid staff member at Chaos for three months at minimum wage, whatever that was at that time. I think it's impossible to overestimate the influence of John Foster who uh, started as a chaos DJ in 1975 at the Evergreen State College radio station and started something called the Lost Music Network, which was a confederation of people across the country who were interested in promoting, advocating uh, independent label music. <clears throat> and that whole idea was revolutionary at the time because no one was making that distinction between major and independent. So he was a real pioneer and he got this network going. And after a while, he started this addition to the program guide of Chaos, um, which reviewed independent label records and things like that. <clears throat> and that was called Op. And the whole idea was it was Lost Music Network LMN, and Op was OP, so it was LMNOP. And uh, later on, Calvin Johnson started a label called K, which was the other end of that sequence of the alphabet. So that's one theory about where that came from, and I think that's the right one because I wanted everyone to discover all the, this great music, whether they were interested or not. I, I came up with the idea of the Green Line policy with, at Chaos, which is the, uh, the policy that says that 80% of, of music played um, should be uh, independent records. Um, we also taught a course, and I became involved in that as a volunteer and teaching uh, people from the community how to do radio and stuff like that. And that's how we met Calvin, by the way, was he came and took that course one year. They encouraged us, well, come on by, just, you know, check out the record library, do it, you know, and just get to know the station. So we would often go there after school and just hang out in the record library and listen to stuff. And all of a sudden, here's this record library with, like, everything I'd ever read about but never been able to listen to. All of a sudden, they were like, oh, do you want a show? Well, how about... Tuesday from like two to six, you know, and like my first show was like four or six hours long or something crazy. And and then it was like, oh, okay. And then like, okay, then what about Wednesday too? From like, you know, it's like, it's like two days in a row, these really long shows where I had hours to fill. And I remember one of, when I first started my radio experience there, uh, a couple of people were warning you about Calvin and they were saying, he just likes to be tough. He just likes to be mean. Like one day he came in, he started a show at seven o'clock and you're supposed to run the, you know, uh, the news, you know, the Pacifica news, and Calvin just said, well, I'm not going to run the news today. Let's just get going. And he didn't run the news. And that was like sort of like Calvin being a punk. You know, we were all the older punk rockers that, or wannabes or whatever that had, you know, the cool records, the radio show. John had the magazine. You know, everybody had bands. And, and we wanted a scene, and we wanted to be, um, like, legitimate but there weren't any real life children in our scene. <laughs> so in many ways, Calvin was like our lone youth. Op Magazine had a whole section just devoted to cassette releases. And I think part of the flowering of the cassette world was the fact that it would get reviewed somewhere. 
and you might be able to sell a couple hundred of them. Op was very funny. John Foster was clearly very hung up on the alphabet because the, the first op was all um, artists whose names began with A, and the next one was B. And um, right around P, I think he vowed that he would stop at Z, and he did. And uh, he went and joined the Peace Corps. It was a way a brain like mine could deal with the just the sheer volume of information coming in. I could I could just focus on one letter at a time. I I loved Op Magazine. I mean, that was a magazine that I read when I was really young and kept reading it until it finally finally wound down. And there were there's so many people who I never would have known about had I not read about them in Op Magazine. And I mean, it's probably horrible to uh, to. <laughs> <laughs> to be John Foster and hear people like me say, you know, gosh, he was perfect. Um, but I mean, he, he really, um, you know, um, he conducted himself in every respect like uh, a hero, like somebody who, um, you know, uh, you would hope to uh, try to be more like. And on meeting Calvin and and I can't remember a particular incident, but you know, picking up um, that he was enthusiastic about punk rock and what it was, it was beginning to occur to me that uh, punk rock was not simply a style of um, you know, like like that it was the music that killed plants, but that punk rock was something that you could do. Lee Hazelwood, Johnny Cash. The Cramps, a uh, crucial, you know, there you have it, that's be happening. Olympia rock scene from the moment I moved here it was always understood that punk rock was about if you can think of it and it's a cool thing and it's a good thing to do then just do it there's no rules and yet elsewhere there would always seem to be these rules you know a rock band is supposed to be a bass player and a drummer and a guitar player and a singer and they're supposed to do it like this and and if you only had to you know you had to dress this certain way and play with a certain amount of distortion then you qualify as punk rock you know not three people playing surf music, uh, in, you know, instrumental surf music with no drummer. You know, that's not punk rock. But to me, that was more punk than the, than the legions of hardcore bands who sounded all the same. I lived in the Ray, and uh, when we first started playing together, and um, so we the first we recorded some stuff in my apartment in the Ray, and then I moved into the Martin, where Brett lived. And uh, I got an apartment there, and we recorded some stuff there. We recorded some stuff in Heather's apartment in the Thompson. Just, you know, put a blaster in the middle of the room and let loose. So we played some parties, and then we thought, okay, well, this is working out, you know. Lauren and Heather and I, we all ran through a few tunes, and then we thought, maybe we should sit down and practice and make up some songs. Because we'd done these shows without doing anything. We're just like, we're going to play at the party. Okay. And we hadn't even played together. And it was pretty exciting. So it was kind of improv, you know? So I dug that, did some recording. But then Laura was like, oh, I'm going to move to Seattle. I don't know. So she moved out. Brett had moved to town, and he just seemed like a good person to work with. So we said, hey, why don't you come and, and do this? And Calvin didn't chose, choose, asked me to be in a band with him because he, I'd blown him away with my chops. You know, it was, <laughs> I think he just like, oh, I want to be in a band with Brett. People, you know, people want what they expect. And we didn't, we weren't what they expected. And so some people, some people would be, depending on the, on the venue, some people would be like, oh, wow, this is, this isn't what we expected and we're excited about it. <laughs> 
other people would be like, this isn't what, what we expected, and we were pissed about it. I think the first you know, time I heard them or saw them, they were a little too kind of... Um, just, I mean, I, aesthetically, the, the sort of jangly, kind of like primitive, like no bass, that didn't really work too well for me initially. With, with the records and the tapes, you only get one part of it. On, on stage, he's so funny, so charismatic, and um, so confident in ways that the average person I don't think can really ever match. Beat Happening was very obscure through most of their career. And then it only got to be uh, around, I think, the international, the IPU festival, that, that things really started to go over. I think uh, Dreamy was the first album that really got any big notice. I think, and uh, Gerard Cosloy at his fanzine Conflict was the guy who, you know, really uh, cheerleaded them early on. That was a magazine I published between 1979 and 1990. It was a self-published, self-edited fanzine that for um, the bulk of its existence, I did most of the writing, but there were later on in the magazine's uh, magazine's tenure there were other people who came to write for it as well but so seeing beat happening and seeing the way that calvin performed and seeing just like just how um intense their performance was and their mu and their songs were so crazy just guitar drums and you know calvin singing like these kind of weird campfire songs you know and the fact that, they, that all three of them sang and the fact that they didn't have a bass player i mean that was all pretty interesting you know and like, i mean this, this this sort of doesn't exactly doesn't exactly reek of ambition, you know. Kay was one of the few. I mean, Kay did so many great cassettes early on. They were one of the few labels that did it right because the music was good, the packaging was really interesting and really original, and there was always some sort of a theme. And that whole store, just you know, records and bins, but then there's this display on the wall with these little these like nine little plastic slots you know just clear plastic and there's cassettes you know like uh let's together let's see and then there, so there's a bunch of k cassettes and the be happening seven inch and it was up on the wall so it seemed important <laughs> so and so i bought it and that was the first um that's before i'd ever seen a, a live punk rock band or anything, I just bought that single because it was on the wall. <laughs> we spent an afternoon and an evening in the studio, in this room, it wasn't a studio, it was just a, a practice room where they brought the equipment in. And something magical happened at that, on that afternoon for me, and I think the music bears that out too. But I heard the music and I was like, wow, this is, we're capable of this. I hadn't thought of the band before then as anything beyond just kind of a challenge to myself and, and something fun to do with these friends in this context of this community where people were getting on stage and doing stuff. First time we worked with him, really defined a lot of things for me about what recording should be like doing the four track stuff because he showed up with an echoplex and a neumann microphone mm -hmm. and then he took it from there it's funny because as lo-fi as the aesthetic is um you know that's like a real like beatles abbey road way to record records you know, with a with an eight track and a couple great old tube mics, and just moving them around the room till things sound good and stuff like that. I don't know if my brother mentioned to you. I think his student loans helped pay for the first beat happening record, and uh, the ability to put out vinyl, and then the response they got once they put that out. I remember I would, he gave me a bunch of their first singles to sell at school, and I tried to sell them, and no one wanted them. <laughs> you know, this hand drawn record company. It's called called K Records, which like. What the hell does that mean? You know, I mean, after, after, you know, record companies named after stores, you know, there's plenty of those, and record companies named after, you know, people's houses or, you know, friends or whatever. I mean, you know, Joe's Records kinds of things. And then, 
then all of a sudden it's K Records. And I was just like, what could possibly be any more oblique? Melvin is a great networker. And I think that's another thing that really, really distinguishes him is that he could make these connections, uh, reach out to people. He connected with Ian Mackay, connected with Sonic Youth, um, you know, basically through, you, you know, letters and phone calls and uh, making connections. The year that Calvin was a senior in high school, and I, I'm guessing that was 78 or 9, uh, Calvin's family moved to Washington, D.C. I'm just guessing, but he worked, when he was in Washington, D.C. that year, he worked at a theater. It was on DuPont Circle. Called the KB Janus Theater, and it had a funky little logo that was the letter K inside a shield. I remember visiting Calvin in D.C. once, and we picked theater. him up at work, and he was cleaning out the popcorn machine. He had a little red jacket that was from this these theaters, and it had a little shield with a K inside. But there is that de-emphasis on, on macho behavior and the fluidity of gender roles in and, and that whole scene, and yet you do have this very typical situation where the male half of the label is the very much the dominant figurehead, the peacock, as it were. And uh, Candace is, you know, the behind the scenes person who gets, you know, a lot of the very unglamorous work done. Uh, and is just as essential to the success of that label as anyone else. Lo-Fi is somewhat of a misnomer, I think, especially when you talk about Beat Happening, because except for that first record, the fidelity is pretty good. You know, the highs are crisp, the lows are punchy, you know. Um, what lo-fi has come to mean is uh, kind of wobbly playing and uh, playing in tune and singing a little flat or something like that. And that's what lo-fi is. Um, you know, Steve Fisk is a very, very excellent engineer, and those records were well recorded. Beat Happening and Calvin in, in general are, were so into this idea of uh, naivete, uh, you know, returning to a kind of a childlike state. And yet, I mean, if you listen to their music, most of the lyrics are about some very dark adult situations. And the music behind it is, you know, quote-unquote naive or quote-unquote primitive. But I think that's a wonderful metaphor. I mean, it, it just shows that, uh, you know, adult life is uh, just as confusing and make it up as you go along as, uh, as, as you were when you were a kid. It's just that the Life is a little bit more complicated, that's all. And uh, I think that's one of their gifts. It was really hard work, and that's one of the things I remember the most. Um, finally getting to meet people was a thrill to be able to put a... And that was sort of the point, was to be able to get together and everybody all in one space to, to meet or to, to re-meet and to be kind of put together for a number of days as opposed to like, hi, I've seen you. I'm going to talk to you and see you play, and then you're going to go. It was, you know, it was like contained. I, mean, I remember going out to the, to, to the IPU convention, and just, it was the most amazing thing. I mean, there was just nothing ever like this. It was so much fun. Um, it was like days and days of, of just going to see bands play. They had like day, morning shows, they had lunchtime shows, and then evening shows at a couple of different venues. Olympia is so tiny that it only had like five venues at the time. Um, but like all the bands were like, very early in their career. Some of them, I mean, I think, I'm pretty sure Bratmobile did their first ever gig there. The Spinanes did their first ever gig there. Um, and just the, the mood was unbelievable. I mean, I went really not knowing what to expect. I went as a journalist with really very, very poor connections in this field. I didn't really know anybody else that was going. And then I got there and ran into a bunch of people that I knew from New York. Um, and it turned out that this had been like the, you know, the, the tribal gathering of 91. I mean, everyone, everyone who knew they should be there was. It never occurred to me that it wouldn't happen. I just assumed it was. And pretty much everybody that I, I wanted to have play, you know, all I had to do was say, hey, I'm doing this thing last week of August. You should be there. And I was like, yeah. It just had this feeling to me. I'm like, okay, I, I know all I have to do is tell these people and they'll be here and, and then, you know, just sort of let people know and they'll come. And it just made sense. It just seemed like it all fit together. And, it, and I was like, well, there are certain kinds of things that I've always thought a show should be and I'm going to make sure those are that way. And, Otherwise, just wanted to just uh, be pretty, pretty easy going. Like I was just in heaven that week. It was the most amazing thing I'd ever done, and I, it was amazing because I didn't know anyone, right. because I was totally anonymous, and I was just like I went to every single show and I took pictures. I was front and center and like every single show. The interesting thing was that the musicians were mingling successfully with the audience. 
I would say having uh, Mr. Mackay there, Mr. Fugazi, doing the door uh, one night at the theater was uh, illuminating to people that this this idolized character within the punk rock scene would actually stoop so low as to do the door. So it sort of broke down a few misconceptions about what the whole uh, interaction within the music scene at that level is about. I think I just, I tore some, I mean, I was working the door to show just because somebody else got sick and I just stepped in and helped out. It was epic. I mean, I can't, you know, everybody was incredible. I do have a really defining memory, though, of the IPU, the night we played, because I think L7 played before us. And I remember I was up in the balcony looking down, and it was just the most incredible scene watching them play. I mean, I remember stuff like, uh, you know, Ian McKay being a ticket taker at, 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 the, at the theater for one of the shows. Because the deal was that, like, everyone kind of pitched in. There was, there was no security. Um, there was no one running it except that Calvin and Candace had booked all the bands and the venues. But there was nobody, like, with a stopwatch going, like, you guys have been playing too long, get off the stage now. Um, there was really no sound man, I don't think. Um, there were no ticket takers. Everyone took turns selling T-shirts, and then on the last, the night before the last show, the cat in the the, the theater. I can't remember the, the, the there's a there's a movie theater which is used as a venue in Olympia. I can't remember what it's called. It's like the the Paradise or the Olympia or the the Supreme or something. Um, the, the, there's a cat that lived inside there and it pissed on all the T-shirts. And so on the last day, nobody could buy T-shirts because they all reeked of cat piss. But you know, it was, but it was the per I mean, what more perfect thing could happen at a K convention? I think you know, for any movement like that, I think you have to have a figurehead and uh, you know, a cult leader, a charismatic front person, and uh, and that would be Calvin Johnson. If you're talking about friends working together, and I think that's what this is all about. I mean, I think K, ideally, it's 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 the spirit of friendship. It's not so much about commerce and market share and how to you know use the label as a battering ram to you know buy someone a, a huge house someday i mean it's more about educating people about different types of music and helping your friends learn how to document their own stuff and get it out there to people in a situation like that a handshake is, is, is the coolest way to, the coolest way of dealing with it it's very instructive to compare the two mottos of sub pop and k uh sub pop was world domination and K was the international pop underground. And if you think about that, the, that world domination has got this very aggressive, we're going to take over thing, we're going to invade from our home base, and we're going to take you over, and we're going to bring you something that's not from your area and have it take over your area. Uh, whereas the international pop underground assumed this kind of network. It was very non-invasive. It was sort of like, here, you're over there in Japan, there, you're in D.C., and we're all connected, and we're all on a team. And it was like a conspiracy rather than a, you know, like an invasion. And I, I think the, the difference is really, really very telling. Well, I, I think the influence of K on the American independent scene is, you know, vast. I think um, they showed, uh, just on a business basis, they showed that you could sell, you know, 2,000 copies of a release and, and, uh, and make it work for you financially, keep coming out with records. Um, you know that was that's that's a pretty crucial thing. They were part of a network which uh, promoted and talked up other records. I think if you look in some of those old K catalogs, they they often talk about other people's other labels' records. You know, people have asked me many times, like, how did you get to be on K Records? And I don't ever really remember asking Calvin or having Calvin ask us. I don't really know. I really can't recall. I walked up to Lois in the hallway at K and said, so hey Lois, would you like to play music with me sometime? And she said something like, um, I don't know, no, maybe. Pat was like, if you ever want to play, you know, give me a call sometime. And I was like, yeah, right, this hippie guy. And then I was like thinking about it later, I was like, Fuck it, I've got all these songs, you know? And uh, so I thought, okay, well, I called Pat and we decided to like, you know, get together and, and practice and I was really charmed by, he came out, he put down a floor tom and a snare and he sat down and he was ready and I was like, awesome. Like, not a full kit, 
he's like, I think that this would be a, a good setup for the music that you play. I wanted to be in a band so bad that I would have been anything, and someone had to write a song. So, like, I never thought I could write a song. I didn't go into it intentionally thinking, like, I'm going to be a songwriter. I was like, what happened to Tucker? Oh, we broke up. I was like, oh, that's too bad. But I thought, hmm, no sense letting a great name like that go to waste. So I wrote this song called A Tiger Trap, and then she was like, oh, hey, we're, we're Tiger Trap, and we want to come play in Olympia. I'm like, oh, you are? Uh, that's good. This is the story, and this is the truth story, okay? When we were listed on the IPU programs and posters as Tiger Trap, months later, Calvin said, whatever happened to this band Tiger Trap? Because it took quite a while, because that was in August, and we didn't start playing until January. And um, somewhere within there, he said, what happened to this band Tiger Trap? And since we hadn't done anything, someone said, I don't know, I think they broke up or something. Like, we had never existed, but nobody knew that. And um, so he said, well, that's a really good name, I'm going to use it. So he wrote that song. I still sometimes think that the whole reason that we're on K is because Calvin felt guilty for stealing our name <laughs> for his song, because we had it first. I feel like the luckiest person in the world. I just can't believe that, I mean, I, I went from being a total K kid and being really into K and loving all these bands, and I don't know how I was lucky enough to get them involved in what I was doing, like that they've put so much faith in me, and like they, I still, feel kind of giddy about it sometimes. Like, I, I'm excited about the fact that I get to be on K because I still think they're awesome. I remember Calvin was down in Portland one time and he was reading um, this Andy Warhol book. And he, he was talking about how he really respected how Andy Warhol had made the factory and had made this place where people had the space to create. And I just remember him being that, he was really impressed by that. And I suddenly realized many, many years later that that's what he had made for, not for himself, but for his community, was this place where people could access space, equipment, technology, art, you know, you'll walk into K at any one time and all sorts of crazy shit's happening. Basically, you know, the whole, the way I saw this building is what we want to do is, is just build this, let's just have an art factory, you know, we'll have the whole building eventually, you know, when the brewery moves out, we'll just move into that side of the building too, not us, but somebody, you know, somebody will be in there doing something interesting. And we just want to fill the building with people who are, who want to do their thing. You're a glass-eyed tiger, I'm a rusty fighter Hydra, you're a freshly withered spider I'm an awkward silence, you guys have in your swimsuit I got a missing tooth, you took the last piece, did you? Well, I hit myself one first Can't keep kissing around anymore My dialing finger is getting too sore Disaster come between